Hi, everyone. Welcome. We'll go ahead and get started in just two more minutes. We'll let folks join. Grab a coffee or water and welcome to tonight's webinar. Hello, everyone. Greetings from Vancouver, British Columbia. Welcome to tonight's 26th consecutive monthly US Canada hands off Venezuela, end sanctions and blockade on Venezuela, free Alex Saab online pickets. It is my pleasure to welcome you all this late afternoon or evening. Thank you for joining uh, tonight's action uh, uniting our voices uh, for the just cause of ending sanctions against Venezuela and freedom for political prisoner Alex Saab held in U.S. jails. My name is Alison Bodine. I am the coordinator of the Fire This Time movement for social justice Venezuela Solidarity Campaign, as well as the author of Revolution and Counter-Revolution in Venezuela. Um, which uh, you can get from Battle of Ideas Press. Uh, and as of who is our technical host, we'll put the link in the chat. We have a really excellent um, panel of speakers, both for directly from Venezuela and who have just returned from Venezuela to talk about um, these pressing and important issues uh, for uh, people uh, in uh, Venezuela and for people around the world. Of course, today's meeting, uh, sorry, which is co-organized, Picket Action, which is co-organized by the Venezuela Peace Committee in Winnipeg, Fire This Time Movement for Social Justice, Venezuela Solidarity Campaign, and Just Peace Advocates, uh, with the support of Venezuela Solidarity Organizations and individuals across Canada. I encourage people, as you've been doing, uh, to post in the chat uh, for uh, where you're joining us from, send your message of solidarity and greetings, and also uh, to let folks know that we have interpretation. Julieta and Laura are here with us to help um, have a completely bilingual webinar. So if you haven't yet, please join the um, interpretation to listen in English. Uh, you can go to the bottom of your screen or device, uh, either press the three dots or the globe icon and press to listen in English as your primary language. Um, Hay interpretación para el acción hoy en línea de esta noche. Eh, para escuchar el español, presione el icono de globo, está en su pantalla y elija español. Gracias a Ana, or sorry, gracias a Julieta y Laura para tu ayuda de este anoche. Okay, so thank you again, everyone. I am uh, joining here from the unceded 
territories of the Coast Salish nations, the Squamish, the Tsleil-Waututh, and the Musqueam. And I ask uh, for anyone speaking here on stolen uh, Indigenous territories to also acknowledge that uh, either in the chat or, or to yourself as we begin tonight's action. Of course, this action is taking place in an important time for Venezuela and for the case of Alex Saab. Um, as I said, we have an excellent panel of speakers, but we also should know full well about uh, some discussion taking place in Colombia today, um, but also uh, within those discussions taking place, of course, the uh, demands of the president of Venezuela, of, of Nicolas Maduro, uh, before entering into any sort of negotiations or discussions for the lifting all sanctions, the return of stolen money, an end to the lawfare against Venezuela and freedom for Alex Saab. So we'll hear more and discuss more about that later, but that is part of the framework for tonight's actions. Those are the demands for Venezuela's sovereignty and self-determination and are the demands that we also raise as people living here in North America. On April 4th, 2023, the United Nations Human Rights Council passed a resolution calling upon all states to, quote, refrain from imposing unilateral coercive measures and, quote, urging the removal of such measures. This anti-sanctions resolution was approved with 33 votes in favor and 13 against and one abstention. Predictably, the United States and their allies including the UK, France, and Germany, voted against the resolution. For people here in Canada, I'll say that Canada is not on the Human Rights Council at this time, so they didn't have a vote. The Biden administration, as well as the Trudeau administration here in Canada, understand fully that cruel sanctions and blockade that they have imposed on the people of Venezuela violates the human rights of the people in Venezuela. Yet, these governments have continued their brutal policies. And every day the people of Venezuela are denied food, medicine, and basic goods because of the sanctions by the United States, Canada, and their allies. And we have important panelists to discuss this and give us the information that we need in order to continue our united fight here from Canada, the United States, and around the world against this cruel and brutal policy. So as we begin this action, I will go ahead and introduce our first panelist. Uh, but I do want to say, I've seen already in the chat some folks uh, posting about the postcard campaign. So I'm just gonna ask Asa to do our first post about the postcard campaign. We, um, the Fire This Time Movement for Social Justice, Venezuela Solidarity Campaign is collaborating with others to uh, send as many postcards as possible, demanding free Alex Saab onto the White House. They're dressed to US President Biden. There's my face. We'll talk more about it later. Uh, but if you haven't received your copies of the postcard, please uh, follow the instructions in the chat, send us an email, and we'll be really happy to put as many in the mail as you think you can use uh, to be important part of this postcard campaign demanding freedom for Alex Saab. So thanks for the, the early posts in the chat, Katerina, and we'll be sure to get some to you. Our first speaker tonight is Ana Gabriela Salazar. She is a sociologist at the Central University of Venezuela and a researcher at the Argos International Observatory on Migration and Human Rights. Anna is also a research coordinator at the Venezuelan human rights organization, SURES, which I have had the pleasure of really of meeting with SURES while in Venezuela and learning about their important work, especially when it comes to the human rights of the people of Venezuela and the impact of these brutal sanctions and blockade. So it's really a pleasure to have Anna here with us. Uh, she's written some really excellent articles recently and we'll share some more information in the chat. But uh, without further ado, please welcome Anna Gabriela Salazar. I will say that um, 
if Anna's internet is not very strong, she's going to turn off her camera, but uh, we'll do our best. And uh, thank you for your patience and thank you for joining, Anna. Hola, hola a todos. Eh, realmente el placer es eh, mío de compartir. My pleasure to share with you this afternoon in Vancouver and, and the evening for the rest of the world for us here in Venezuela. It's a pleasure for me to share with you our experience, our knowledge on, on the sanctions and on the situation of Venezuela. At SURES, we have developed a research line on the impact of coercive unilateral uh, coercive measures on human rights. We have detailed not only it, their impact on a macroeconomic level, on income and finances at the country, but actually, actually also the negative effects on people by this uh, so-called sanctions especially on people who belong to groups of society that have been historically vulnerable. We have uh, followed up and carried out several measures for some years and it's different kinds of sanctions that have been imposed on the population and the businesses on the institutions of Venezuela have been uh, analyzed. Today we will discuss some issues that should be taken into account as to the sanctions imposed by the United States and their allies. And please let me know if I'm speaking too fast for the interpreters. Is it okay so far? Yes, very well. Let's continue. So the first item is on secondary sanctions, which consolidate, consolidate the blockade. These are threats of sanctioning against uh, foreign agents to discourage financial and trade relations with uh, state agents, uh, individuals, official businesses or organizations. In this case, these are threats of sanctions against foreign actors for being in trade relations with Venezuela. These threats of imposing secondary sanctions against non-American actors is one of the main obstacles for foreign investment and for uh, expanding markets in Venezuela after all these years of um, economic and commercial blockade. Now, the second item has to do with the um, over compliance by third party states at businesses and financial institutes that limit transactions and trade relations of uh, sanctioned states. Some examples of this overcompliance are um, closing uh, accounts by uh, international banking institutions, um, the unilateral uh, suspension of contracts and the suspension of air uh, travel. This, which has been imposed by the United States on Venezuela, implies going beyond the initial scope of unilateral coercive measures due to the fear that this creates. Uh, if agents are involved with entities of Venezuela, when they are engaging in trade with Venezuela, they can be targeted and be um, the, the target of the sanctions, even if these activities do not actually uh, affect the United States. And why am I mentioning this? Well, it's, has, it has been proven that secondary measures and over compliance of coercive measures are based on the principle of extraterritoriality 
that is being met by legal organizations in America for applying coercive measures. This infringes international law and deepens its effect on human rights. So what have I here to offer today to share with you? These are uh, concrete information points on the application of overcompliance and secondary coercive measures. So let's speak of a specific case related to blockade and secondary sanctions. This is a very interesting case because it's related to um, our work. At Sures, we have proven the correlation between the application of unilateral coercive measures and the phenomenon of Venezuelan migration to other uh, countries. Let's remember that Venezuelan migrants have been politically persecuted in the United States and in other parts of the world. Let's see this case. We have identified uh, the Venezuelan uh, airline, Combiasa, and in accordance with the executive order decreed on August 2019, the uh, fleet of air uh, of airplanes was blocked and could not, uh, in order to guarantee a reinforced compliance with American sanctions. So the fear that the secondary sanctions created on the state and private businesses have impacted operations to uh, bring back Venezuelan migrants who voluntarily want to come back through the this plan, uh, Vuelta a la Patria, that was implemented by the national government in 2018. Now, how can we make this more visible? What happens in some countries in the region? Some countries had some flight permits denied for the repatriation flights. And at the same time, in Peru, it was denied to give fuel to one of the planes, aircrafts, that wanted to take Venezuelan migrants back to their country, back to Venezuela. Another of the impacts that we can also uh, mention is the overcompliance of the sanctions has had an impact on finances in Venezuela. The closure, the unilateral closure of the Venezuelan bank accounts abroad implied an increase in the cost of transactions and in the cost of commercial transactions for the acquisition of imports, including medicines and food. There was also an interruption in the services provided in the country so as to cause complications or complications by the, of course, all of this imposed by the US government, always making the services more precarious because it is no longer possible to hire a service like a um, software or a license, a software service license, things that historically we had been able to acquire here in the country. So there is a core point that needs to be taken into account. The licenses do not ensure the full normality of economic transactions, mm, uh, commercial, financial transactions between the Venezuelan banks and between the third parties. This has been talked about in different reports of the special rapporteurs for different aspects or different topics in the UN. Even in the presence of humanitarian missions, the infrastructure or even the necessary goods for the population are affected. However, so the point is, how can we understand 
all of this better. That is to say, all the measures, the unilateral measures that were taken, imposed the blockade against Venezuela, we can say that the threats are effective because the companies are afraid that their property, the real estate, which is, for example, in the US, that it will get blocked. That has affected cases where they tried to exchange oil, for example, Venezuelan oil in exchange for gas oil or corn or even um, trucks to provide water. There have always been, there have also been mechanisms to create more concern in the private sector by financial risk alerts. And maybe the case of the suspension or of certain services. Now, in terms of the financial sector, there have been bank accounts closed, services interrupted, the flow of the state operations are in danger, there are transactions that are prohibited, that is to say, between customers and Venezuelan entities. And I would like to point out something else that is very significant indeed, the use of the US dollar as a weapon or as a tool to hinder these kind of operations that has have an impact on the SWIFT process that have hindered essential services, processes or purchases. And it has have an impact on the necessary infrastructure to ensure that the basic utilities and that the basic services will continue being provided in Venezuela. And even more serious have been the impact in terms of food and health. The impact has been very strong for women, for people with uh, some kind of handicap or disabled people, for children, for teenagers, and for indigenous communities. However, people who are in risk, that is to say, people with chronic diseases, people with, I mean, disabled people, people with HIV, AIDS, with cancer, with cardiopathies, or the elderly children with a transplantation need, among others, just to mention a few, they felt the impact and the consequences of these coercitive measures even more because they have an impact on their right to life. During the pandemic, there was an increase in the blockage. Uh, the blockade, the, the background blockade that also included the vaccines against COVID or the, for the payment of these vaccines. Most of the vaccines that actually reached the country, that came to the country against COVID, were acquired, were bought by means of international cooperation, by means of allies or by means of certain agencies. And that's why we wanted to share this knowledge because it's not true that, they're, that they have only been managed by the authorities or by the government. And we also want to challenge the vision that these sanctions are we applied to certain sectors. So in order to wrap up and not to, to speak too much, I think I'm uh, over time already. Anyway, the problem, the problem of the sanctions is that whenever you attack the main company of the Venezuelan state, where all the politics and where everything was based in order to provide security, safety, and the compliance of the basic rights, then you are attacking the whole of the population. And that's why we can see a backlash uh, and a slowdown of all the social indica indicators in the areas of health, because that starts, for example, when a drastic decrease of income for the state takes place from PDVSA as well. That's how this phenomenon started, a phenomenon of migration to other countries, which so far had been unprecedented in the history of our country. 
So it is essential to say that the main reason why they are migrating is the economic reason. People were trying to improve their material uh, possibilities for themselves, for their families. And in order to wrap up, that's why I think it is so important to continue denouncing the impact, the impact that sanctions are having on human rights of the whole of the population. And that's why it is important to have these kind of actions to denounce imperialism of the US and their allies, as well as the new mechanisms that interventionist mechanisms and to ask for the end of the blockade. That's it for me. I want to thank you all. And that's it. Thanks. Thank you very much, Anna, for that comprehensive overview of the, especially the extraterritorial nature of the sanctions, which means that there is no argument to be made when people say, oh, it's just the United States or it's just Canada. Venezuela could trade with anyone around the world. That is a baseless argument and something that is not playing out on the ground when, as you said, Companies are coerced, they are forced, and they are uh, afraid of trading with Venezuela because of the consequences. And um, we know that people of Venezuela are fighting every day to find new solutions, to diversify the economy, to use creativity and, and trade with other sanctioned nations because the United States sanctions nearly a third of the world or more. So, um, we really appreciate that information and your perspective and all of the work of Sures and um, also of Argos. And we look forward to following uh, your work in the future. Thank you so much for your time today. If there's any links you want to put in the chat, I'm gonna put a few from Venezuela analysis in English, for example, then please feel free to put them in the chat. So up next, uh, we have with us Dr. Jose Luis uh, Aguero, who is uh, with us as a representative from the network of jurists for Venezuela and for freedom for Alex Saab. Uh, thank you, uh, Doctor, for joining with us today. Um, we didn't have a chance to check your audio, but uh, hopefully it all looks good. Um, the floor is yours. Welcome. Gracias, gracias. Muchas gracias por... Thank you. Thank you indeed. Thanks for giving me this opportunity. I wanted to greet everyone, to thank and congratulate for the presenta previous presentation, to say hello to everyone who's joining us from Caracas, Venezuela, as a member of the network of jurists of Venezuela to defend our nation, to defend Venezuela, and also as part of the Free Alex Saab movement, also as part of the movement and the organization, I would like to make the most of this space in order to denounce again, as we have done, as we have been doing so far since June the 12th, 2020, which was the date when our special um, member, Alex Saab, was kidnapped despite his, his international aspects and his job and what they tried to say against him. Our diplomat, Alex Saab, was, was a Venezuelan and Colombian businessman sanctioned by the US for businesses of, and they said they blamed him of money laundering. The idea here is to be able to contribute with um, some more details of the kidnap of Alex Saab. It's been more than 1,025 days of this arbitrary detention, and we can actually discuss the term arbitrary detention because we've reached a conclusion after making the assessment um, based on the protocols of international law and human rights, Alex Saab has been kidnapped by the Cabo Verde, the Cape Green 
government and in October 2021 was sent to the US. So this represents a criminalization act, not only towards a person, but towards Venezuela in itself. As the previous speaker said herself as well, Venezuela is subject to a series of systematic aggressions that could be considered to have started in 2016 by the systematic aggression to our economy to the extent of destroying our economic capacity, economic sustainability. There are a, an endless amount of actions, war actions that the US with their allies, European allies mainly, has started against Venezuela, not only because they were trying to impose this kind of colonialism again, this is one of the topics that Venezuela has def has been defended against year after year. This colonial appropriation that they conducted and that gave one of the exam one of the examples of the imperialist actions against our country. More recently, the appropriation of our gold at an international level, going through an intervention of our finances because of the true commercial and legitimate commercialization of our oil. Now that we're talking about kidnap, and a kidnap implies that he was retained illegally, and the crew actually was kidnapped during weeks, for weeks. By means of diplomatic and legal actions, we managed to free our personnel, that is to say the crew from the from the plane cabin, but still the plane is kidnapped itself as well. It's, it's taken, it's kept there. Now I'm saying this as a reference or as a background to give some background to the kidnap of Alex Saab. Alex Saab was accredited by our country since 2018. Many people have tried to say um, that he had been accredited the day after he was detained to try and skip the criterion of the of the international public opinion, etc. But Alex Saab had been accredited since 2018 as a, as, as, as a diplomat of our country, as a special rapporteur of our country. When he was kidnapped then on June the 20th, the 12th, 2020, once his plane was stopped, stopping there for reprovisioning, and he was sent for a peace mission. It is important to say that it is not only, um, he was not only a diplomat there, but he was the representative, he was the head of a special mission and for humanitarian reasons that has a very serious context in terms of violations of international law and international frameworks, etc. So maybe uh, next time we will be able to expand on this. I don't have enough time today to, to dwell too much on this. But I would like to point out one of the most serious job elements. Alex Saab is a person, is a Venezuelan from the large um, Colombian Venezuelan or from these two nations. He was born in Colombia. He was um, nationalized as a Venezuelan citizen. And that's why the president, Nicolas Maduro, has the possibility to send him as a special um, rapporteur and as a diplomat. Since he was detained once the plane was reprovisioning, was um, uh, getting more fuel there with all the violations of the international law that this implies, he was detained and then he was sent to the US where all his rights, his human rights and basic rights were violated. For example, having been for so much time uh, not allowed to get in touch with his relatives, his family, Alex Sam is a person who has survived cancer and it was not and they didn't allow any medical treatment to be given to him in this place where he has been arrested 
one of the elements that we denounce internationally is that one of the reasons why Alex Saab was detained in such a way, was kidnapped in such a way, is an action against Venezuela, against the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela. And it, they've tried to show this as a legitimate action of the U.S. because it is being prosecuted by the courts. Once again, the U.S. tries to show itself as the police of the world or as the judge of the world when they are actually acting with their courts and with their judges as if they were judging a criminal of war, as if the, these were the Hague, you know, as if the, these were the criminal courts. And they know that their courts and the prosecution offices do not have, I mean, the jurisdiction doesn't apply to that. These, uh, this is arbitrary and he should be protected by the system of the international public law because he was a special uh, rapporteur and a special diplomat. In Venezuela, we started an international and national campaign to try to foster, well, from the jurists network as well, to try to defend Alex Saab, to try to defend him from, well, and defend ourselves from the systematic aggressions on our economy. And we are a whole group of jurists, lawyers, fighters from social movements, NGOs, and different groups that work with jurists and with legal aspects in different social organizations and different communities in Venezuela. And we have this vocation towards human rights. So we've gathered more than eight organizations of jurists and conducted several meetings in Venezuela, in the interior of the country and in the capital city with the participation of thousands of local lawyers. This is an extraordinary example of how this jurist forum in Venezuela is trying to defend our diplomat. And this is a legal defense on the one hand, but it is also a political defense because what lies behind the aggression that we are living and experiencing with him is an action of war, trying to be disguised as a legitimate action in the US when we all actually know the constant bombardment that we are being victims of Venez the Venezuelan people. I mean, just by making or taking the decision of deciding to bring stability to our nation with the legitimate government of Nicolás Maduro and the previous government of Hugo Chávez. It's no secret that the U.S. is using our diplomat as a prisoner of war in order to twist the willingness of the government about what they've historically wanted to do, which has become worse recently with the Bolivarian revolution in these last 23 years. That's why it is so important for us, for our network, to make an international denounce of all the, and with all the allies that are also committed to the defense of the international public law, to defend human rights. This is not just a Venezuelan issue. Actually, any person or government that decides to undertake the real exercise of their sovereignty can be victims of this sort of uh, kidnapping and uh, actions related to war, even with recent background of piracy, for example, as we have been victims of um, blockades to our ships, ships bringing fuel, for example, to our country, because one of these warfare actions have been also conducted against the fuel company of Venezuela that have, has been recovering slowly. And this, entails uh, blockading uh, the provision of services to our oil refining uh, companies. So we are victims of piracy as well in high seas in when our ships want to uh, provide the technology and the input that we uh, 
required to provide oil for the basic needs of our Venezuelan people. So this is a set of warfare actions of which Alex Saab has been victim. He was kidnapped as um, a soldier could have been uh, captured during a war. It's just a further action to discourage Venezuelan people uh, from defending their sovereignty and supporting the legitimate government of Nicolas Maduro. So I don't want to go over my time. Maybe next, in my next turn, I can uh, delve deeper into the internal uh, legal framework of the United States that has also been violated violated because there have been pronouncements of jurists in America and in Africa and in other continents who have uh, reported and uh, expressed their concern all around the world as of how the United States is uh, violating the legal, uh, the, the international legal framework, for example, the kidnapping of our diplomat is one big example of that. So thank you so much for the opportunity. And from here, from Venezuela, we uh, congratulate this sort of sessions that allow us to break uh, that uh, media um, blockade that does not allow for people to know the truth or to know of the endless systematic actions against Venezuela, not only to the government of Nicolas Maduro, but actually to the whole Venezuelan people. So thank you for the opportunity. And of course, we'll be here available for uh, con to continue uh, joining our voices to denounce this sort of attacks against Venezuela. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Jose Luis Aguero. Uh, very appreciated your analysis and overview of the case of Alex Saab. Very true that there is a media blockade around his case. People in Canada, the United States, hear very little about the torture that the United States has imposed on Alex Saab, about the violations of international law. We have to use our voices in order to unite and share about uh, his case, which, as you said, is not only critical to people in Venezuela or his family, but is a matter of the very fundamental violations of the United States of international law and human rights. Um, so uh, really appreciate your analysis and joining here today. Uh, also incredible to think it's been a thousand days that Alex Saab has been held and uh, his health situation, as we've learned in previous actions is very critical and we have to uh, work urgently for his freedom which is possible because we know the Alex Saab movement uh, the association of jurists and many others in Venezuela are working every day uh, for the freedom of Alex Saab and organizing on the streets and doing what they can uh, for his freedom so today's picket action actually I'll say there was a protest also in Colombia today with the Free Alex Saab movement in Colombia, uh, who held the street protest for freedom for Alex Saab. Um, and then also today's action is kind of kicking off a week of to free Alex Saab, an international week to free Alex Saab, called for by the Free Alex Saab Committee, uh, which, which includes activists from the United States, uh, Venezuela, and also in Canada, the Fire This Time Movement for Social Justice, Venezuela Solidarity Campaign is part of that. Um, so there'll be more coming activities in the next 10 days in support of Alex Saab, especially uh, from here in North America. Just wanted to, um, as Arnold gets ready to join, uh, to also announce again, of course, the Alex Saab, free Alex Saab postcard campaign. Um, what that means is that uh, we can work together to send as many postcards as possible to President Biden, to the White House, uh, really to demand Alex Saab's freedom. These postcards can be used at events and actions. They have, of course, a denouncement uh, regarding the case of Alex Saab calling for his freedom in the back, but all the basic information about his case. So not only is it a postcard that needs to be put in the mail as uh, really to bombard the White House, 
uh, with demands for Alex Saab's freedom, but it's also a public education campaign because these can be handed out to talk about the basics of Alex's case and to convince people to join with us in adding their voice to demands for his freedom. So uh, to get involved in the postcard campaign is really easy. You can join with you know, uh, thousands of others that, that have already gotten involved, been given postcards, started to put them in the mail, as we've seen in the chat. Uh, just email FTT Venezuela Solidarity at gmail.com uh, or send me a message. The information is in the chat and we will get postcards to you for you to distribute, for you to put in the in the mail once a day, multiple times a day. Let's work together uh, to make sure that uh, Biden cannot escape our demands for freedom for Alex Saab. Um, so today we have here with us uh, Arnold August. Arnold is uh, based here in Canada, in Montreal, Quebec. Uh, he's a member of the editorial board for the International Manifesto Group and a contributing editor to the Canada Files. Arnold's the author of, of numerous books, especially on Cuba, um, but also uh, Arnold has had many articles and experiences in, in Venezuela that he's here to share with us about. Arnold's books have been translated uh, from English into Spanish and Farsi, and uh, he continues to write regularly about Canada-Venezuela affairs. So we've heard today about uh, the important case of Alex Saab, the impact of sanctions on Venezuela, and Arnold is here to give us some eyewitness report from Venezuela and some important perspective um, from here in, in Canada and Quebec. So thanks, Arnold, for joining the floor is yours and we're ready for the videos. Just keep, let us know when you're ready. Of course. Thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, hello to all of the um, panelists, especially those from uh, Venezuela and people from Venezuela who are listening as well as from Canada and the United States. But before I go into my uh, reflection and uh, showing up some video clips of my last visit to uh, Caracas last month, I would just like to say hello to my friend, Professor Luis Acuña. And we always meet this way. It's better than nothing. But next time I go to Caracas, we have to find time to see each other and hug each other as we did in the embassy in Ottawa. By the way, have you noticed that Juan Guaido showed up in the Miami airport yesterday, leaving behind in Venezuela any support, even from the opposition parties, let alone from the people. He arrived there, and even though he is still officially recognized, believe it or not, as the president of Venezuela, the, the American government was not even there in the airport to welcome him. So what does the, for example, the Canadian government, who all these years have been saying, well, Guaido is, is part of a, a mass movement in Venezuela against President Maduro, et cetera, that the international community is in, behind Guaido. What do they have to say today? For example, the so-called fake ambassador from Guaido in Ottawa, does he have anything to say about the complete failure of the U.S.-backed Guaido campaign? He arrived in Miami. What a shame. You know, this guy's supposed to be some an international personality. He arrived there all on his own, no one there to greet him. So this is very good for news for us. I would like to make just a few short comments with regards to my recent uh, visit uh, to uh, Venezuela was uh, the fifth one, specifically with regards to the uh, how it relates to the important campaign that's going on now to free Alex Saab, as well as, of course, the Bolivarian Revolution. Now, um, I think one of the most important, what I would suggest then, why don't we do this? Let us go into the clips that I took and then we'll you know, discuss it and uh, I'll make some points based on the clips and hopefully the translators will have time to, to present as faithfully as possible what was said in Spanish at that time. So shall we roll it? Sounds good, here we go.
It's almost uh, over 1,000 days ever since uh, Alex was in, is in the hands of the United States, and he said in an audio. Uh, Alex he told me in this call that the United States must cease with this attack against Venezuela. This, uh, I'm sorry, the audio is very, very bad. This goes in line with the thinking of Commander Hugo Chavez. of Che Guevara. We want to really show very clearly that uh, we learned to love Chavez due to that solidarity showed. And everything that hurts Venezuela also hurts It? I think so, yeah. Yeah, sure. So where should I start? Uh, well, you know, I'm mainly going to talk about, you know, Camilla's uh, presentation on the importance of the Alex Saab case. But, you know, looking at that video once again, you see that lineup of all those people from different countries all over Latin America. You had basically the, all of the left in Latin America was right there in Caracas. So while I was sitting there, I couldn't believe my eyes. Are all of these people going to physically be there? Like just the fact that the Venezuela, the Bolivarian Revolution, was able to do this, carry this out, having those all of the leftist leaders virtually in Caracas under the same roof, not very far from the United States, whose main goal is to destroy the Bolivarian Revolution. This shows once again having been able to carry it out in such a way, the strength, uh, strength of the Bolivarian Revolution. And on the issue of Alex Saab, uh, how you know, it, the, his wife explained, it's very clear, we, we have to be frank about it. His life is in danger by the United States. The United States has, is known historically to use imprisonments or whatever, to slowly murder people. They tried it even like the Cuban Five before they were liberated. And there are many other examples. We have the issue, of course, Julian Assange. Nothing is above the goal of the United States. Nothing can be taken for granted with regard to the United States. They are capable of anything. Thus, at this time, more than ever, when his life is in danger, for the reasons explained by the previous comment, we have to go all out, even more so, to demand that Alex Sab be released and has immediate attention and also be released. One may say, well, you know, this is a tall order. Can we do it? Well, I think that the work that 
everyone here has been doing, United States, Canada, and Venezuela, is paying off. Just the other day, I uh, came across a post by Carlos Ron, who is the first uh, is the uh, first vice minister of foreign affairs for Venezuela, responsible for North America, that is United States and Canada. He posted a great article, legal article, almost academic article, very well argued on the issue of Alex Sapp. Now, was this article in Fire This Time? Was it in Black Alliance for Peace? Was it in Code Pink website? No, it was in the Forbes magazine, one of the most important financial magazines and institutions in the United in the United States and the Western world. A great article. In fact, after this, I will post that article into the chat box so people can read it and also use it as an instrument to increase the uh, increase the, the uh, struggle that everyone is leading to free Alex. I think, you know, you heard, uh, you know, I was convinced before, but listening to his wife speak with all the facts and, and with such assurance and determination, it's important that people all over the world, now we're talking mainly from Canada, United States, perhaps elsewhere, we have to do everything that we can to make sure that family is reunited and also to make sure that the dignity of Venezuela is upheld because by, just by holding them in that way and in fact trying to have a slow motion murder of him is an insult not only to Venezuela, but to humanity, to the civilization. How can they do this to someone whose only purpose was to assist his government, his people, to acquire food and other necessities of life as a result, as the previous speakers have meant, as a result of all these sanctions? So let us go all out. Everything is possible. If Forbes had something in it, that means this is possible. And I think just once again, to point out the importance of their Bolivarian revolution. What can I say? My, it was my fifth visit. The only thing I can say, go to Venezuela. If you are, if you have already been there, like many here have been, go again. If not, next time there's an opportunity, join a group or make a group in order to go and visit Venezuela. Because the experience, in my view, of the Bolivarian revolution and how uh, Nicolas Maduro after 10 years after the passing of, uh, of Hugo Chavez, that's why we were invited there uh, in March to uh, celebrate and, uh, and underline the importance of Hugo Chavez on the 10th anniversary of his physical passing. It is important that people know about this, know about the Bolivian Re Revolution, its strength, etc. You know, in order to spread the truth with regards to Venezuela, as well as part of this overall campaign to free Alex Saab, because Alex Saab and his wife are part of that Bolivarian revolution. They are part of Venezuela. Thank you. Thank you, Arnold. Um, as with so many that return from Venezuela, we can feel that determination in your voice. It's, it is true that anyone who can get there, it's, it's not easy. The sanctions have made it difficult. The fear campaign of the U.S. government saying don't go to Venezuela has made it difficult. Um, but any opportunity that people have, I think, is an incredible learning experience and a chance to see uh, the Bolivarian revolutionary process in motion, but hopefully also to see the impact of U.S. policy on people in Venezuela and to come back more committed to fighting it. There are a lot of folks on this chat, it's true, and on this webinar that are part of this daily struggle, um, who are part of trying to put pressure on the US government, the government of Canada to end the sanctions and blockade, to normalize diplomatic relations, and to free Alex Saab. I mean, President Maduro laid out what needs to happen in order uh, to uh, have any sort of progress movement in, in Venice or forward movement <laughs> when it comes to US Venezuela relations and that starts with an ending of the sanctions and freeing of Alex Saab and an end to US meddling in Venezuela so um let's let's continue to unite our efforts thank you for making the time to to join with I'll, us and for putting together Alison I just I just posted yeah. that uh, Forbes I just want to make uh, one other comment sure and it, it, if people notice who were those speak by the way as I was watching all those speakers all those left 
left revolutionary. I would think to myself that someone in Canada is having a nightmare when he sees it. I'm talking about the C CBC State Department plant in CBC, Ivan Durr. He writes, always is writing against Venezuela, against Cuba, anything progressive, even the new government <laughs> in Colombia. So that, you know, is a nightmare for him to see. I don't know if he saw it, but he definitely knew about it. All of the revolutionary leaders under the same roof. And that is thanks to the Bol Bolivarian Revolution. And uh, so we have to, uh, you know, make sure that this revolution is defended. And we uh, explain to people increasing the significance of it. Great, thank you. Um, so next, uh, we will of course uh, have very soon our greetings from across Canada and our group photo where we raise our voices together, we can chant together and um, we share our photo uh, to let folks know how to get involved or to, to invite people to join with us next time and to uh, keep up this constant movement and consistent movement for Alex Saab and against sanctions. Uh, but we have with us tonight, uh, Professor Luis Acuna, uh, who it is a pleasure to see every month. I completely agree with Arnold. Uh, we would prefer not to meet this way every month, but instead to meet in Ottawa or in Canada or in Venezuela in person. Um, but unfortunately, Professor Luis Acuna is doing his job as Charge de Affairs of the Venezuelan Embassy in Canada from Venezuela uh, due to this hostility in relations between Canada and the government of Venezuela on Canada's part. Um, hopefully, as this Juan Guaido farce uh, that it always was continues to fall, uh, the government of Canada will be forced to recognize the democratically elected government of President Nicolas Maduro, but for now, they're side by side with the U.S. in maintaining this absurdity, um, which I will say is, is not an absurdity only uh, because it has gratefully, uh, greatly impacted the people of Venezuela who have lost millions of dollars uh, in assets and gold that is in England. We have folks joining us from England because of this, uh, this um, farcical, uh, you know, political maneuver by the United States with Juan Guaido. So anyhow, a tangent, <laughs> but here we have Professor Luis Acuna and it's really a pleasure to have with, with uh, you here with us every month and uh, to bring your important perspective as Charge de Affairs and as a longtime supporter and organizer in the Bolivarian revolutionary process. It is always an honor. The floor is yours. Hello, Alison. And hello, everybody in Canada and US and every place. And in Venezuela, you see in the chat, many people from Venezuela, uh, greetings in the, in the chat. <clears throat> I am very, very pleased tonight. Uh, the, the talk of Anna is very, very important because Anna was able to, was able to explain what the, uh, these coercive um, measures, the, the unilateral coercive measure means for the Venezuelan people. They are not measured against someone or one people those measures uh, are against all the people of Venezuela. All of us suffer these, these sanctions because they apply in every, every sense. Uh, we know how hard uh, is health here because the sanctions, education, uh, keeping the industrial uh, Network working is very, very hard because we cannot get spare parts. So it's very, very hard. Thanks, thanks to Anna, because we think that someone has to explain this, not only to the Venezuelan people, but all, also to the people from other countries that are the ones who are joining us in this webinar. And again, uh, uh, Alison, I think this, this is the 27th in a row uh, a webinar uh, in behalf of Venezuelan people. So we have to thank you. And also uh, to uh, uh, Jose Luis Agüero, 
uh, I want to thank you for the explanation. Although the case of uh, Alex Saab is, is a political case. I mean, it's not a matter of lawyers. The Alex Saab is in jail because it's a political uh, kidnapping. It's, it's not a matter of lawyers. But lawyers are very, very important to explain people what is going on with Alex Saab. And I think that the network that you and your friends keep in Venezuela uh, are very, very important for explaining what is the case of Alex Saab. We will keep working and fighting uh, for the release of Alex Saab. And we know that he will be released, but uh, we don't know when. Uh, but we, we have all the, all the reasons uh, to, to have Alex Saab free. There are not any reason for Alex Saab to be in jail at this moment. And uh, Arnold, I hope that we can see each other again, either in Caracas or in, in Canada. I don't know if I ever will be able to go to Canada again as a diplomat, uh, but uh, and I cannot go as a tourist. If, uh, if I ever have to go is when this thing ends and I have to go to uh, offer, I mean, someone have to replace me at the embassy somewhere, somewhere, and I will have to go there at this moment. And I hope I will see you again. Uh, your work is very, very important for us too, uh, Arnold, because your books are the way in which people know what is going on in Venezuela. And regarding this meeting of the 10th anniversary of the past of uh, President Hugo Chavez, all of those who were there were not there because they are leftists. They were there because they are Bolivarian people. They believe in the ideas of uh, Simon Bolivar. They believe in liberty, and they believe that the Bolivarian revolution is keeping, is pushing for, for that in every country in Latin America and in the world. And those are our friends, us in our stroll as the same way that you and many of your friends and, and Alison will accompany us with this struggle of us for our liberty, for our sovereignty, and for the free determination of this country. We don't want, again, an empire uh, rolling in this country. We fought for that two, 200 years ago, and we will keep fighting. So thanks very much very much to all of you. Very, very important, all the words that you uh, expressed tonight in the webinar. Thank you, Alison. And uh, we will see you next week, next, next month again. Yeah, uh, online, unfortunately. Uh, but yes, yeah, thank you. Um, for, people are posting in the chat. Thank you for giving us the hope every month as well. It's uh, just really a pleasure to have you here uh, always and to see you and to learn from your experience um, of always maintaining hope uh, despite difficult conditions. And um, that's just so important uh, for us. Before uh, we go to our, our greetings section of the, the meeting. I'll give folks who are going to give greetings a chance to uh, upgrade themselves and, and get online. I just wanted to announce one more time and encourage people to send us an email about the Alex Saab postcard campaign um, to get your copy. We are, we'll put them in the mail. All you have to do is hand them out and, and get some stamps. Uh, to send to U.S. President Joe Biden. They can be sent from any country around the world. And uh, we are very happy to put many in the mail for you uh, to hand out. As I said, there's a educational information on the back, including about 
the impact of brutal sanctions on Venezuela um, and about the important case of Alex Saab and his uh, health and uh, the necessity for his freedom. So uh, let's work together. Let's uh, build the Alex Saab postcard campaign, especially within the international week of action for Alex Saab and really to uh, make sure in order to uh, flood the White House, make sure President Joe Biden uh, knows full well there are people in all corners of the world that are dedicated to freedom for Alex Saab. So thank you all. As we'll put in the chat once again about Freedom for Alex Saab and joining the postcard campaign. And you can order as many as you'd like. Really happy to put them in the mail. Just send us your address. There we are. So uh, we will now bring up people uh, from across Canada who are here to give greetings. I wanted to start with uh, Mary Carmen Guevara because Mary Carmen was with Professor Luisa Cunha in Ottawa for many years. Mary Carmen is a strong supporter of the Bolivarian revolutionary process, a constant organizer in support of uh, Venezuela and other just causes. And it is great to have you here with such a beautiful setting too in your background, Mary <laughs> Carmen. Yeah, thank you, Alison. It's so wonderful to be here with, with all of you tonight. Uh, Greeting from ALBA Social Movements here in Ottawa. We really miss uh, Professor Acuña. You should come back. We were doing a beautiful work when he was here with us. We have to continue fighting until the embassy will be open again. Thank you very much. And we continue ham of Venezuela. Manos fuera de Venezuela. Gracias. Thank you, Mary Carmen. Um, next, uh, we have up here Karen Rodman. I think she's just rejoining. Karen is with Just Peace Advocates, and they have uh, just come off of a really important tour about sanctions. Um, so maybe, Karen, you could share us a little bit about that tour, and thanks for joining tonight. Yeah, thank you so much, Allison, and thank you for keeping this heartbeat drumbeat going month after month, and for all of those who uh, join from Venezuela, from the U.S., from Canada, uh, to keep us informed and keep us motivated. Um, yeah, we were very pleased to uh, host uh, um, uh, a book tour for Sanctions Kill and the uh, Global Wrecking Ball a book. Um, I also maybe would put a plug in as well for the International People's Tribunal and the hearings that are taking place uh, that will uh, uh, look at that are looking at sanctions, blockades, and economic course of measures. And uh, of course, that wraps up in or comes to the uh, conclusion uh, in Venezuela in July. Um, a really uh, powerful uh, webinar or uh, broadcasting of the hearing, I should say. Uh, yesterday uh, um, from Iran. So I'll drop a couple of those links in if that's okay, Allison. And um, and thank you to all, gracias, and free Alex Saab. Free Alex Saab, yes. Thank you, Karen. Please definitely put those links in the chat. There's this ongoing international tribunal, which will conclude in Venezuela, is my understanding. So uh, we must follow that important work. And um, I wanted to just take a second to announce the next action, um, which everyone can put in their calendars. Uh, the next Venezuela, uh, US Canada hands off Venezuela free Alex Saab online picket action will be on Tuesday, May 29th. So we're kind of at the last Tuesdays of each month being a good time uh, to come together internationally and demand uh, freedom for Alex Saab and an end to criminal US-Canada sanctions on Venezuela. Uh, thank you again to our incredible panelists for tonight, Professor Luis Acuna, Arnold August, Dr. Jose Luis Aguero, and to Ana Gabriela Salazar. It's really been a pleasure to have uh, you here and to have um, so much important information shared 
uh, for us to use in our ongoing campaigns as we begin uh, hopefully to continue um, talking to people on the street. The weather is getting nicer. We need to have street actions and protests as well as our ongoing campaigns um, online in order to support this important work uh, in defense of Venezuela's sovereignty and self-determination, Venezuela's basic right to exist and to choose their own government without the pressure of the United States and their allies on them uh, demanding that they have uh, you know changes made to their government so uh, we'll all watch carefully what's happening in colombia but we will keep our eyes on the united states government our pressure on the united states government as we work together to to free alex saab um, again postcard information is in the chat get your copies and uh you can send me a message on zoom too i'll get it before we close but uh, I think that's going to close us off uh, for tonight. Um, again, we have folks here from across Canada, uh, the UK, Venezuela, different parts of Latin America. It's really been great to see you. Um, please continue to check the chat for some important links. And we're going to start upgrading folks to join us here in this section uh, of uh, so we can all turn on our cameras. As you get those uh, invitations, it says promote to panelist. So something will pop up on your screen that will say, do you want to rejoin the webinar as a panelist? If you would like to join us, chant together, turn on your cameras and uh, be part of our closing for tonight's virtual online picket action, then go ahead and accept the invitation. I'm also going to close us out uh, with one more final announcement. Which is about an event happening this weekend, uh, the uh, Latin America and Caribbean Policy Forum, an action initiated by Code Pink in the United States, who has often collaborated on these picket actions and other events. It's uh, called In Search of a New U.S. Policy for a New Latin America, burying 200 years of the Monroe Doctrine, and features uh, speakers as well as discussion, uh, which is both in-person and online. So there's one day of only in-person activities in Washington, DC, in the heart of the United States uh, on April 28th. And then on April 29th, uh, there'll be a live broadcast of the events. Um, there's many sponsoring organizations from the United States uh, and also from here in Canada, the Fire This Time movement for social justice is joining with others to um, build and support this important event. So there's more information at americaspolicyforum.org. You can um, click and join and say that you want to join online, and then you'll get the online links, uh, which will also be uh, shared on many platforms. So folks should be getting uh, the invitation to upgrade. If you have not received an invitation and you would like to upgrade and join us, then please raise your hand or post your name in the chat, and we would be happy to welcome you into this space. Gustavo, would you like to say a few words as people join? Uh, yes, Alison, I'm very welcome. Very, I'm very, very pleased to have been to have joined this meeting, this speaker tonight. Especially from Colombia. Where's Salvo, I think you might have frozen. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but Gustavo uh, is joining us uh, here from um, Colombia, from the Colombian movement in solidarity with Cuba. But I actually met Gustavo in Venezuela a few years ago. Sorry, Gustavo, the signal is cutting out. I'm going to try and turn your camera off and see if that helps. 
continue to promote people. To my recommend. Sorry, Gustavo, we, we turned off your camera to see if that would help the sound at all. If you're still there, go ahead and. And then we're going to go ahead and. Gustavo, do you want to try and speak again? Some of us are still joining here, but Gustavo, if you want to unmute without your camera, we might be able to hear you better. Okay, looks like it won't work today, but again, thank, thank you, Gustavo. We'll go ahead and get ready for our group photo and for some chanting. Uh, if folks are able to um, get themselves ready, um, we'll go ahead and turn off interpretation and then we'll also turn off the, um, we'll let everyone turn on their mics. Dejar que todos. Thank you very much again to Julieta and Laura for your translation tonight. Uh, if you still want to be in the picture, raise your hand. All right. Anyone missing from the photo yet? Post in the chat. Looks like we're good. We can do some chanting and then we'll take our photo. Free Alex Sam. Free Alex Sam. Free Alex Sam. Free Alex Now. Free Alex Now. Free Alex Free Alex Now. Free Alex Sam. Free Alex Sam. Free Alex Saab, you all look great. Oh, looks like free, we have some more Alex requests Saab. to upgrade. <laughs> free Alex Saab. It's very free Alex Saab. Saab. Thank you for joining. It's, uh, we are an international movement to free Alex Saab. Again, send us an email. Get your Alex Saab postcard. Free Alex Saab. Free, free, Alex, Saab. free Alex 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 Saab. And out free in the street. Free Al-Assad. Let's work together to end all sanctions in Venezuela and to end this uh, cruel campaign of blockade and to free Alex Saab, U.S. Uh, help in U.S. Alex Saab. Saab. Free Alex Saab. Free Alex Saab. Free Alex Saab. Free Alex Saab.